he means more to me than you will ever know. I would like to see the baby. Welcome to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in The Mandalorian, Chapter 15. The episode opens on the Carthon chop fields with a New Republic prison ship bringing in some fresh fish. Most new fish come close to madness the first night. Now this was the same ship that Mando and crew broke into back in Chapter 6. This alien is a Hask, who we first saw in Maz's castle in The Force Awakens. He might even be Sart Jalas, one of the mugshots that we saw in the last episode. Mayfeld, Bill Burr's character from Chapter 6, is working to pull useful metal from a decommissioned TIE fighter. Symbolically, this is interesting. He is an old relic of the Empire, sorting through physical relics of the Empire to find something useful. And that's his arc in this episode. At first, we're not sure if he'll squeal to his former Imperial buddies. The minute he gets inside, he'll tip him off. He'll be a hero. Because, you know, like every imp is a bad guy. But then he turns on the Empire and becomes a more useful citizen. A great deal of this episode is from the Imperial point of view. We cheer at the arrival of TIE Fighters. <laughs> and Mayfeld tries to paint the picture that Imperials and the Republic are the same. Yeah, Empire, New Republic. It's all the same to these people. But the Empire's atrocities drove him from the military, and in this episode gave him his redemption and freedom. Also in the chop fields, AT-ATs have been repurposed as cranes, like we saw in Chapter 11. It's a great visual reminder that the New Republic is trying to remove the galaxy away from war and into an era of rebuilding. We previously saw a New Republic security droid from Chapter 6. This time it's armed with electrical batons, which reminded me of the electrostaffs used by Grievous's IG-100 droids. He also bears the symbol of the New Republic, modified slightly from the the Rebel Alliance symbol to include a circle of stars that represent the planets of the Republic. Mayfeld's 34667 inmate number is written in arabesque letters on his suit. You'll notice here that Boba Fett was so happy to get his armor back that he cleaned it up all shiny and new. Now this, of course, is the Mandalorian sigil of a mythosaur skull, but this is the sigil of Jaster Morell. This is the Death Watch leader who made Jango Fett a Mandalorian. Now we first saw these events in the Jango Fett comic book, but also made canon by Jango Fett's chain code in Chapter 14. When they take off in Slave 1, notice the ship is kind of moving around them. This is to keep them upright as the ship moves from its landing to flight position. Now this is really cool because we've seen Slave 1 for years, but up until now, all we've seen is the cockpit. Very quick aside, it looks like a younger Fennec Shand is going to appear in the Bad Batch. That's pretty cool. They go to planet Morak, named after this Klingon. Nah, I'm just kidding. The name Morak has appeared in Star Wars a few times. It's the name of creatures from a planet called Irudiri, who appeared in the second volume of the Aftermath trilogy. On Morak, they mined Rhydonium, a very combustible fuel used during the Clone Wars and a little bit during Star Wars Rebels. Allow me to introduce you to one of my oldest and most explosive friends, Rhydonium. The Rhydonium is transported in red canisters like we've seen on the animated shows. Now, when they're discussing who should go to the base, Boba says, Let's just say they might recognize my face. Because, of course, he's a clone of Jango Fett, like all the other version 1 stormtroopers. They also mention, No, I'm wanted by the ISB. The ISB stands for Imperial Security Bureau. You know, these guys. They're the Imperial Secret Police, and Moff Gideon came up through this organization. Din Djarin decides to compromise on his number one rule. Have you ever removed your helmet? No. This is the way. This is the way. So, let's talk about that helmet removal. This season has introduced other Mandalorians who freely remove their helmets. This is how Den learned that the way does not mean the only way. Children of the Watch are a cult of religious zealots that broke away from Mandalorian society. Their goal was to reestablish the ancient way. So, as he spends more time away from his religious sect and he meets other people, he starts to broaden his outlook. Now he's learning that taking off his helmet doesn't necessarily mean he can't be a Mandalorian anymore, only that he won't be one of these Mandalorians. So the moment here where he shows his face has actually been seated throughout the season. And while we're on the subject, if he always has his helmet on, why does he have a perfectly manicured mustache? Matt Singer did a piece on this for the website. You should definitely read it if you have time, but I want to hear your theories down in the comments. Why bother to carve an immaculate flavor saver on your lip if you were wearing a helmet? Or is this like a Henry Cavill situation where Pedro Pascal had it for another role? I don't know, moving on. Mayfeld says, You know what, I'm taking this thing off. I can't see anything. Which is a nice nod to this. I can't see a thing in this helmet. The two of them are disguised as tank troopers, and later we can see Death Star laser troopers in the background. So we've seen the Juggernauts before. They first appeared in Revenge of the Sith and were used all throughout the Clone Wars. But this one is a cargo vehicle. 
not a prisoner transport like the one that we saw in Rogue One. As they drive along their route, Mando looks at the foundlings, reminding him of his youth and why being a Mandalorian means so much to him. But also, it reminds him of how much he loves Grogu. See, little moments like this are laying the groundwork for the helmet removal that we see later on. Mayfeld says, Look, if you're born on Mandalore, you believe one thing. If you're born on Alderaan, you believe something else. But guess what? Neither one of them exists anymore. So of course, Alderaan was destroyed by the Death Star. What? And Mandalore still exists, but the Empire decimated it, so it's likely uninhabited. That planet is cursed. Anyone who goes there dies. So I never noticed before that Mando and Cara Dune have this connection. They're both from dead worlds. Later, we see her arriving at an understanding with Mayfeld. When she sees how much he hates the Empire, she gives him a free pass. Now, they're attacked by what Mando thinks are pirates, but I think are insurgents. Invaders on their land is all we are. They want to blow up the Rhydonium to end Imperial occupation of their world. And they use thermal detonators like we first saw in Return of the Jedi. Because he's holding a thermal detonator! <laughs> when the Rhydonium is upset, these Arabesh letters spell out warning. When Mando fights these guys off, it was fun seeing how crappy Imperial armor is compared to his best car. <laughs> He's used to fighting with the best, and this puts him at a disadvantage. I've pointed out in a few videos this season that The Mandalorian borrows heavily from westerns and samurai movies. This sequence is like a classic train heist, but it also has the DNA of the climactic chase of the movie Stagecoach, one of Jon Favreau's favorite films. It's also very similar to Wages of Fear, a movie about truck drivers transporting dangerous explosives. But, probably more directly, it's shot very similar to Mad Max Fury Road. And this moment... <laughs> seems straight out of an Indiana Jones movie. My favorite part of this episode was seeing the Imperial troops celebrating, which really humanized these soldiers. But Mayfeld points out that what we're actually seeing here is colonialism. I'm just saying, somewhere someone in this galaxy is ruling and others are being ruled. That's why I think these guys were insurgents and not pirates. In fact, the shot at the end of this sequence directly mirrors Apocalypse Now, a movie which criticizes colonial rule of Vietnam. Now, these troopers are coastal troopers, which have appeared most prominently in Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Now, the Arabesh on this readout is pretty boring stuff, but I translated it anyways, so here we go. ID face required, access granted, database, equipment, personnel, transport, armory, and S-forces, which probably stands for Special Forces. Cruiser and light speed, and this just says SEC. Fallon Hess asked for Den's TK number, and this is the designation given to all stormtroopers. TK-421, why aren't you at your post? Mayfeld tries to brush him off with paperwork. Come on, let's go fill out those TPS reports. Now this is a reference to the endless memos that Peter is beholden to in the movie Office Space. Uh, you apparently didn't put one of the new cover sheets on your TPS reports. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry about that. I, I forgot. Mmm. Yeah. He also says Den since his vessel lost pressure in Tanab. Tanab was the site of a battle where Lando pulled off one impressive maneuver. Someone must have told him about my little maneuver at the Battle of Tanab. And by the way, if he looks familiar, maybe it's because he was Joe Chill in Batman Begins and the Night King on Game of Thrones. Mayfield goes off on a rant about Operation Cinder. How about a toast to Operation Cinder? So, what is Operation Cinder? Well, after the Battle of Endor, this was the Emperor's contingency plan. Palpatine thought that if the Empire wasn't strong enough to protect him, then it didn't deserve to exist. So, he enabled certain ships to burn planets to the ground. The planet, he mentions, I was in Burning Con was a mining planet that first appeared in the Star Wars Uprising mobile game. It was also name-checked in the Shattered Empire comic book as one of the planets destroyed by Operation Cinder. And I loved this whole inglorious bastard style scene, especially that the Imperial officer has a southern accent. See, boys, everybody thinks they want freedom. But what they really want is order. Remember, Imperials are usually quite English. The Death Star, the Death Star just full of British actors opening doors and going, oh, I'm, oh. <laughs> and this reminds me of another Western trope. See, in many Westerns, such as the Undefeated, Confederate troops who refused to surrender fled to Mexico, far away from the American government. The Mandalorian takes place on the fringes of the galaxy where the New Republic isn't strong. So it's where these defeated soldiers, these Confederates in space, have fled to. He also says, the new republic is in complete disarray and we grow stronger. And he's not wrong. See, this isn't really in the movies, but the new republic failed because it's very difficult to get thousands of star systems to agree on one policy. And after they demilitarized, they had difficulty maintaining order without the Jedi Knights. I thought it was very sweet when Mayfeld said, You did what you had to do. I never saw your face. Especially after he mocked him in chapter six. Maybe he's a Gungan. 
Is that why you so don't want to show your face? <laughs> of course, this could have been a defensive move because old Mando probably would have killed him. Remember, no living thing has seen me without my helmet. Now, when they escape, Mayfeld uses a cycler rifle to blow up the Rhydonium. This is the rifle used by Tusken Raiders that Boba Fett acquired on Tatooine, where he was apparently gorging himself on Bantha meat. Now, most of the Arabesh letters on Fennec Shan's scope spell out target coordinates, except for this one. This is your mom. Now then, to escape the planet, Boba Fett drops the seismic bomb we first saw in Attack of the Clones. Now, Moff Gideon's ship is an Arquintans class light command cruiser that we first saw in Star Wars Rebels. These are much smaller than the Imperial Star Destroyers we see in the movies. And it makes sense that he would be on a smaller ship because the Empire wouldn't have the manpower to operate a huge destroyer. And the episode ends with Din Djarin repeating Moff Gideon's speech from Chapter 8. It means more to me than, than you will ever know. And also, this guy in the production art looks an awful lot like Poe Dameron. Weird, right? Well, that's all the Easter eggs I found, but if you found any, let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe. For Screen Crush, I am Ryan Airy.